Wow, the glory of the Lord has descended in this place. I'm just looking at all the fog, so. As Pastor Eddie said, we are in a multi-week series about health. What does it truly mean, as Jude said, I would that you would all be in health and prosper as your soul prospers. So we're looking at the various components of what the writer had in mind when he said that, when he wrote that, and when the Holy Spirit inscripturated that, put it in our Bible. But one of the components of health that we find is rest. If you go to your physician for an annual physical, one of the questions that he will ask, other than do you really need to eat that many donuts, one of the questions that he will ask is, how are you sleeping? How many hours of rest do you get every night? Because he knows that by asking that question and you giving a successful response, it's going to be an indicator of your overall health. But beyond just the hours of physical sleep, rest, what about rest for your soul, your thoughts, your emotions? And this rest beyond just good REM sleep affects every aspect of your health. I mean, if you're not getting good physical rest, how many of you know it begins to drag down everything else going on? I mean, it's hard for you to be nice, not only to your spouse and to your pets and to your children. It's hard to be nice to you because you're just cranky. Forget hangry. If you don't get enough sleep, you're just not real pleasant to be around. And how many times I, my, my wife and I tomorrow will celebrate 43 years of marriage. And... We've walked together long enough that we pretty much know you need a snack. Or I can look at my wife and say, have you, have you had enough water to drink today? Or why don't you go take a big nap, one or the other? Because we begin to realize, we begin to see certain things that begin to affect our thinking. They begin to affect our emotions, the way we process situation and circumstance coming at our life. Because we get out of rest. But how we view rest is often problematic in attempting to acquire it. You see, we live in a culture and unfortunately some of this has been transferred and translated to the church. That work equal work equals worth. In other words, your capacity your, if you wish, your production is directly tied with your worth. And so if work equals worth, our worth equals our fulfillment. Our fulfillment equals happiness. But not so much. Because the math and the equations fall apart pretty quickly. You see, if our work, if our production is the goal. And we often surmise that then somehow rest is earned or deserved relative to our productivity. I want to say that one more time. If our work, our production is the goal, then our rest is earned or deserved through productivity. So, more work, more productivity, then the more rest that we have earned. How many of you know, particularly as it relates to the things of the kingdom, that earning things is always a slippery slope? And yet, these are all faulty presuppositions on which to base one's life. That it's goals and rewards, especially for true disciples. John chapter 6, they come to Jesus and they ask a very legitimate question in verses 28 and 29. They said, what must we do to do the works God requires? 
Now we've got all these, we've got the Ten Commandments, we've got these hundreds of points of the law, and they're trying to figure out what of this is being required of us in order to be in right relationship or walk in righteousness. What are the works God requires? And Jesus, the way that Jesus just has a way of both understating and overstating at the same time, he says this, the work of God is this, to believe in the one he has sent. They were looking for the list. And what Jesus gave them was the, an impossible list. Here's work, believe. How many of you know that it's work to believe? It's hard work to believe. John 15, the vine and the branches. You know this, I'm the, van, I'm the vine, you're the branches. If a man remains in me, I in him. He will bear much fruit apart from me. You can do nada, nothing. And if anyone doesn't remain, he's like a branch thrown away, withers, picked up. These branches are picked up, thrown into the fire and burned. But if you remain in me and and my words remain in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be given. And this is to my Father's glory that you bear much fruit, showing yourself to be my disciples. Now, reread that passage of Scripture. That's an easy one at one level, but I don't know about you, but that might be... One of my biggest failures as a Christian. Knowing it theologically. It's not, there's nothing that's, that's really obscure about what is being described here in Scripture. And yet how much of our life we continue to try to navigate apart from the vine. It's an amazing thing. And we find that the fruit is always found in the divine. Dietrich Bonhoeffer, 20th century theologian, martyr, wrote a little book called The Cost of Discipleship. Read it sometime, you can get saved all over again. Was one of the voices that spoke out against the silence of the church as to what was happening in Germany. And just a few weeks before the end of World War II, he was martyred for his faith. And Bonhoeffer wrote this, Fruit is always the miraculous, the created. It is never the result of willing, but always a growth. And the fruit of the Spirit is a gift of God, and only He can produce it. And they who bear it know as little about it as the tree knows of its fruit. They know only the power of him on whom their life depends. Our fruit-bearing capacity is all about God doing something in us, through us. Divine, meaning it begins, it ends with him. And it's the manifestation of that fruit. And the release that releases faith in us of God at work in and through us. John 15 again, verses 16 and 17. You didn't choose me, but I chose you, appointed you to go and bear fruit that will last, and then the Father will give you whatever you ask in my name. So the work of God, to believe. Then there's the warfare of God, and it's simply to stand. Nehemiah, the fourth chapter. They're trying to restore the the burned down, the broken down walls of this city. And they are under constant harassment and assault of keeping this construction project from moving forward. Nehemiah chapter 4 verse 20 says, When you hear the sound of the trumpet, join us there. And it says, Our God will fight for us. It says, you show up, God will show off. You show up, God will do the fighting. Ephesians, the sixth chapter, talks about the armor of God. That when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground. And after you've done everything, to stand. The warfare of God. Now, that doesn't mean that we don't have other weapons of our warfare. But do you realize that the primary weapon is to stand? Our primary weapon of warfare 
is rest. It makes the enemy crazy. It makes him nuts. Because the one thing that he wants to do is to come and harass you. To get your eyes off of the vine. To get your eyes off of God. And on to that thing that is assailing and assaulting you in that, in that moment. And in that war, we war differently. We war in peace. We war in peace. Why? Because we are in the only war in history that the outcome was decided before it ever started. It makes our conflict completely unique to every other conflict in human history and civilizations. Makes you wonder, why do we do it at all? The work of God, the warfare of God. But then there's a way through that God has designed. The way of God. And it's one of rest and peace acquired only his way. John chapter 14, verse 27. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give you. I don't give it to you as the world gives. Don't let your hearts be troubled and don't be afraid. John 16, 33. I've told you these things so that in me you may have peace. Because in the world, baby, you will have trouble. But take heart. What? I have overcome the world. So if... This fruit, this warfare, if it's divine in nature, then what is our participation? How do we position ourselves to do the work of believing, to bear fruit, to wage a warfare the way God has intended? Well, I believe we find that in Hebrews, the fourth chapter, verses 9 through 11. There remains then a Sabbath rest. For the people of God. For anyone who enters God's rest also rests from his own work as God did from his. Let us therefore make every effort to enter that rest so that no one will what? Fall by following their example of disobedience. Another translation and one I like a little bit better is says strive to enter Rest. Well, that seems like a contradiction of terms, doesn't it? You want me to strive to rest. But I believe it's in that contradiction that we find truth. You see, the rest that I believe that God is speaking of here is not just a rest from, it is a rest in See, many times when we think about the concept of rest, we rest from something. We rest from conflict. We rest from work. But I believe that that is a very limited understanding of the Sabbath rest of God. It's not just a resting from something. It's resting in someone. It's resting in a result that maybe we don't even see it yet. But by faith, we've already apprehended it, and it brings rest to our souls. Wow. And his rest is not earned. It is both a command and a gift at the same time. Are there benefits? Absolutely. And there is a command of rest as a pattern of God himself. Genesis chapter 2, you know this. By the seventh day, God had done what? He had finished. So on the seventh day, he rested from his work. And he blessed the seventh day. He made it optional. No, he made it what? Holy. Holy. Now, can we just stop and unpack that for a moment? You know, one of the things that got God and still gets God real excited is confusing the profane and the holy. And you know, when we begin to make things optional that God has declared holy, we've made them profane. It's why many people, for instance, who have been a misunderstanding of the Holy Spirit, 
and the operation of the Holy Spirit. That somehow they've made it optional for those crazy charismatics or those crazy Pentecostals. And in making it optional, then somehow in their ignorance, they have taken something as holy as the third person of God himself and reduced it to just a power source. A USB connection for spiritual gifts. Interesting. He called it holy because on it he rested from all the work of creating what he was done. And God wasn't tired. I'm sorry, but that's an anthropomorphism that doesn't work when it comes to a God who never sleeps nor slumbers. God doesn't need rest because he's God. He's always been. He will always be. He is ever attentive. He doesn't tire like you and I. God wasn't tired. He was what? He was finished. You see, the connection of the Sabbath principle of God is a manifestation of finishing, of completeness. Leviticus 23, 3, six days you may work, but on the seventh, it's a, it's a Sabbath of rest, a day of what? Sacred. There it is again. Holy, sacred assembly. You are not to do any work wherever you live. It is a Sabbath to whom? The Lord. Not to the NFL. Not to Netflix. It is a Sabbath to the Lord. Wow. Wow. Is there a moment? Every seven? Yes. But more importantly, I believe there is an entering of God's rest. That's beyond just, I'm going to keep the seventh as holy unto the Lord. I believe that there's a wider principle that God wants us to step into of entering his rest. There remains then a Sabbath rest for the people of God. Wow. And that manifestation of the Sabbath is a declaration of God's finishing. And not just in creation, but in redemption. It's why Jesus said on the cross, not I'm tired, not, not just, yeah, yeah. he didn't say he was tired, he was exhausted unto death. But what did he say as he departed? He says, it is finished. And he wasn't speaking to yielding his physical breath, his, his physical life. It was not taken from him, he yielded it. Don't kid yourself. Nothing's ever been taken from God, including Jesus on the cross. He says, it is finished. Why? Because he was speaking of the redemptive work, that which he came to do, it was finished in that moment. And our Sabbath observance, come on, saints, listen to me. It is a manifestation of God's finishing in your life as well. This is why many times we wonder, why is our faith so weak? Why am I so weak in my body and in my soul? Because you haven't stepped into the Sabbath principle of realizing it is finished. Again, it's not just an issue of resting from something. It's resting in someone. So what are some benchmarks, first of all, of unrest? First of all, I am undeserving of that rest. Why am I so tired? My wife and I, we're not as young as we used to be. Well, she is, I'm not. And sometimes we'll just kind of go through this, I'm, so, I'm just tired, I'm tired. Well, maybe, you, you know, I don't, I don't ever tell her she's not 24, but I say, I'm not 24. And so, but many times, I haven't done anything to be tired. Therefore, I don't deserve to rest. Ever had that dialogue? Maybe you've had that discussion in your brain. But you see, inasmuch as you are undeserving of forgiveness, mercy, and grace, yet you still appropriate all of those things, why would we not appropriate the rest of God as a divine impartation and a divine gift as well. Oh, I don't need that. I'm going to work through it. Go ahead. And listen to me. A soul that will not find rest in him will ultimately become an undisciplined soul. 
that will lead to an unruly soul which will be unusually prone to rebellion and lead us into sin rather than righteousness. A soul that will never rest is always going to be looking for trouble. Come on. <laughs> Benchmarks of unrest. Worry. God needs some help. The least I can do is worry about it. And yet, that lack of rest is simply a manifestation of a lack of trust. That's all it is. God, I don't really trust you. Therefore, I'm going to jump out of rest and I'm going to worry a little bit. Wow. And then, that leads us to these moments of frantic intercession. Oh, God, Jesus, God, Father, Lord. Oh, Shundai. I mean, we just, and we just go after it at that point. You ever heard men and women pray and they barely come up for air? Because it's, it's intercession that's not being propelled along by the wind of the Spirit, but it's actually a spirit of worry that somehow I've got to let all of this verbiage and all of this energy somehow blast it off to heaven. Maybe that will get God's attention. We've got to do something. You ever, you ever heard, we've got to do something. We, <laughs> Peter, got a little worked up. We, we, we got to do something. Shoom. He starts whacking off body parts. Got to do something in this moment. And this worry will invariably open a demonic door to fear. Because worry never emanates from faith and trust. Never. It always has its genesis in fear. And the enemy knows this. And when we get out of rest, out of God's rest, many times it's also a manifestation that we're trying to carry more than God has designed us to carry. Because we're not really convinced God can carry it alone. God, you need some help. Let me, let me shoulder part of this. Wow. Yet what did he say in Matthew? He says, come to me. Those of you who are weary, burdened, I'll give you what? Rest. I will give you something in exchange. I'm not asking for your help. I will give you something. Take my yoke upon you. Learn from me for I'm gentle and humble and you will find rest for your souls. Do you realize when you try to take on God's yoke that one of the first things that leaves is your rest? Because it was never yours to tote. That's a good southern word. It was never yours to carry. It doesn't fit your shoulders well at all. And quite frankly, you don't look real pretty trying to carry it. I got this. Christians walking around like Quasimodo. And we wonder why nobody wants what we're selling. Because we're trying to be God. And we've taken on all these weights and burdens. The church has given a shot to that. Many times by deviating from its primary its primary mission of preaching this gospel and making disciples to all these other things that we try to put on our shoulders and we wonder why it doesn't fit the church real well. I'm done with that. Too much trouble. And we get out of yoke, we get out of rest, and we, we begin to, again, carry that which was only designed for him. And then once once we do that, we get out of rest, then our true revelation of who he is, it stops as well. He says, and learn of what? Learn of me. How do we learn of him? By getting in the proper yoke with God. Hmm. Isaiah 9. And the government will be where? On his shoulders. 
Verse 7, of the increase of his government, not your government. Regardless of how well you think you might be wielding it over your life. Of the increase of his government and peace, there will be no end. And you see, that peace, that rest, it's not like the world's. The world says work eight, sleep eight. Work five, rest one. Work 50, get two off. Retire at 70 and a half and then drop dead. That's pretty much how the world does it. So we've looked at some benchmarks of unrest, but what are some of the manifestations of rest? Psalm 37, be still. How many times did I hear that growing up? Boy, be still. <laughs> children, I mean, you know, this was, this was before they had all the three-letter designations for children's, right? I mean, our parents just said, boy, if you don't sit down, be still. Here we are, the psalmist. It says, be still before the Lord and wait patiently for him. It says, don't fret. What does that mean? Don't worry. When men succeed in their ways and when they carry out their wicked schemes. Psalm 46.10, be still and know that I am God. And here then becomes the great catch 22. Be still and know I'm God and know I'm God by being still. You can take those two things and easily, happily, just exchange them. Proverbs, I have stilled and quieted my soul. Like a weaned child within me. Like a weaned child with its mother. And many of us, we just, it's so hard for us to still our souls. To come beside those still waters. And to let God impart to us the rest that only he can do. Psalm 62, my soul finds rest in God alone. If you look at this entire passage, these eight verses, and look at the number of times that the word alone is repeated. My salvation comes from him. He alone is my rock and my salvation. Find rest, O oh my soul, in God alone. You're never going to find it anywhere else. Biblical rest is not rest from. It's resting in that fact of the personhood. But we have to command ourselves. We have to get postured, positioned, if you wish, in order to receive the gift and the impartation of rest that God has apportioned for each one of us. 1 John 3, 19. This then is how we know that we belong to the truth and how we set our hearts, what? At rest in his presence. Once again, another interchangeable passage because it's only in his presence that we ever find rest. This is why we can't just be running back and forth in the context of our spiritual disciplines, in the Bible a little bit, praying over here a little bit. This is why if we're going to remain in the Sabbath rest of God, we have to remain in his presence. And we live in a really agitated world that doesn't understand rest at all. The best that they have for it is therapy medication but the author of rest is offering it to you and to me on a continual basis and the world from starving of rest to striving to rest psalm 116 7 be at rest once more O my soul for the lord has been good to you Psalm 139 23 search me O god know my heart test and know my anxious thoughts. Saints, part of being in good health is not just occasionally visiting Sabbath, observing Sabbath, 
but it's stepping in and living in the Sabbath rest of God himself. You will never deserve rest in as much as you never will deserve mercy or grace or any other attribute of God. The work is already done. The work is to believe. God's done the heavy lifting on that. He says, just believe. We don't war as a war, as the world wars. We war in peace. And the way that God intends for all of it to happen is as a manifested rest in our life. That men and women, they look at us and they say, what are you on? Can I get a prescription for that? I'm, I'm abiding in the vine and I'm walking, living in the rest of God himself. Rest is one of those words that our culture doesn't use. They barely, again, they barely understand what the concept of it is. And yet, for you and me, we are encouraged. We're commanded, strive to enter. Pray with me. Lord, help us tonight. Hear well. But God, not just hear well, but respond better. Lord, we repent to you tonight of those areas in our life where we have fallen out of rest. Because God, we have failed to be in your presence. God, somehow that whatever situation and circumstance has pressed against us, that somehow we feel like we need to work through it. We need to worry through it. When your command to us is simply abide, stay connected, stay in my presence, stay in the Sabbath rest that I've ordered for you, manifest my finished work in your life through my Sabbath rest. If you're here in this room tonight or if you're watching via the internet, and you say, Pastor Jim, I, I, I'm so tired, so tired. That's why he says, come to me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. But that rest is only found in Jesus. Nowhere else. And to step into that Sabbath, it begins by an acknowledgement that he is Lord. He came, he died the death that you should have died to live the life that you can now live. And it begins by you confessing that, believing in your heart that God raised him from the dead. Your life can be forever changed. And it begins by an affirmation, an acknowledgement of that which I just said. If that's you, slip your hands up. Those of you watching online, just nod or thumbs up or do whatever you do online. But have an encounter with God right now. Take that which has been pressing you out of measure. Let God take it. Let him carry it. Lord, thank you for this people, this great church. Lord, let us be men and women of the Sabbath. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you, church.